Folks, it's lovely to see you along this evening for our evening gospel service. You're very welcome. And if you uh, would look here to the front and you'll see on the screen uh, Psalm 37. We're going to sing it together as our opening praise. Psalm 37, the verses 3 through to the verses 9. Uh, you'll know this from a couple of weeks ago. Set thou, set thou thy trust upon the Lord, and be thou doing good, and so thou in the land shalt dwell, and verily have food. Delight thyself in God. He'll give thine heart's desire to thee. Thy way to God commit him trust. It bring to pass shall he. It's good to see you along. I want to welcome you, those who are tuning in uh, from home, and those out in the car park. Um, we're in the dark evenings now, so you'll just have to... Listening into the radio, there'll be nothing to distract you from listening out there in the car park. So we're going to stand and sing together, please. good singing. We're just going to unite our hearts in prayer. It's lovely to see you along this evening. And if you know the Lord, I want you to pray in your heart and ask God to bless and to undertake. If you don't know the Lord as your Savior, well, your prayer ought to be that uh, tonight you'll come and put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we're going to pray together. Just going to ask for the Lord's blessing now upon our meeting. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just still our hearts in your holy presence. We thank you, Lord, that we can come and speak to you, Lord. We know, Lord, that you are in heaven and we are upon the earth. And, Lord, your word tells us, Lord, that our words ought to be few. 
So, Lord, as we come to you, Lord, we just pray that you would direct our thoughts and our words, O God. We know, Lord, that today we have failed you. Today, Lord, we have sinned. Today, Lord, we have fallen short of what we ought to be. But, Lord, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we just approach into your presence, Lord, and his merits. O God, we thank you for a Saviour, Lord, who said, It is finished. One who said, Lord, that, Lord, oh, Lord in that, in that uh, phrase, Lord, that he said, it is finished, Lord, it was the end. The sin price had been paid, Lord. The debt had been cleared. And, O oh God, Lord, we thank you that on the third day he rose again from the dead. Lord, we come to you in his name. We just thank you, Lord, for the blessings that we've enjoyed today. The fact, Lord, that now, tonight, we're here, Lord, to meet in your presence, to worship you, O God. And we come, Lord, and we uh, bring, Lord, our feeble words of praise and adoration to you. But, Lord, we pray that there'll be a work in our hearts now, O God, by the Spirit of God, to prepare us, Lord, to worship you right. We pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, for that fresh cleansing, Lord, by the precious blood. We pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, for that thankful heart, O God, that heart of obedience, that heart, Lord, that rededicates itself to you again, Lord, even at this point in time. We pray for all that are gathered in here, Lord, tonight. We thank you for this place that you've established, Lord, for the preaching of your word. We thank you, Lord, that what you've done over 50 years is, Lord, to thee and to thy glory alone. And, O God, we pray, Lord, as we come tonight to meet together, Lord, that you will meet with us and we will know your presence, Lord, and your speaking voice and your help, O God, and your strength, Lord, as we meet together here. We just think, Lord, of this congregation and all the needs that exist, Lord, and that we pray for all our individual families, Lord. We pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, that you would keep your hand upon our homes and upon our families. You'll give us wisdom, Lord, each day to walk with you and help us, Lord, to follow along, Lord, in the path that you have set out. We pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, for places, Lord, where there's trouble and difficulty, anxiety and care, worry, Lord, and concern. Oh, God, we pray, Lord, there that you'll come in to those homes and hearts tonight, Lord, and you'll minister to them. That tonight as they listen, Lord, even to the word of God that you'll just speak and you'll bring peace and you'll bring strength, Lord, to them. We pray, Heavenly Father, for our minister, Lord, who's come, O oh God, Lord, even to minister among us, Lord. We thank you for him. We pray that you'll bless him and his family. Think of the Reverend Foster, Lord, who's come tonight, Lord, as a special preacher. We pray that you'll fill him with God, the Holy Spirit, and you'll help him, Lord, to bring your word. And, O oh God, we think of our land, we pray again, Lord, for our Queen, Lord, and our government, those that are appointed, Lord, into power, ordained by Thee. We pray, O God, that they will know and understand, that they will give an account, Lord, O God, of the responsibility that You have given to them. And we pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, that You will remember our land tonight. You'll remember our nation. At this time, O God, that You will bring, Lord, this pandemic to an end. You will give us protection, Lord, in our homes and families. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll be with us, Lord, as we seek to re-establish, Lord, the various parts of the work that you'll undertake. We think of the building program, Lord. We pray that you will meet the need there. And, O oh God, we will know your blessing and your help. So be with us tonight, Lord, we pray. We just remember, Lord, those that can't be here through duty, Lord, or sickness, or some other reason, Lord, that you would remember them where they are. And you may bless them and be with them, Lord, we pray. Lord, most of all, if there's one here tonight, Lord, that one, Lord, that is without Christ or without thee, Lord, or walking far away from thee, that you will bring them back, that you will save them, Lord, by your grace, that you would do this, Lord, for your glory and for your honour, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. We're coming to hymn 302. Jesus, thy blood... And righteousness, my beauty are, my glorious dress, midst flaming worlds, and these arrayed with joy shall I lift up 
my head. So we're going to sing these lovely words together. We're going to stand and sing, please. Thank you very much, Neville. Let us turn to God's Word, and the reading will be taken from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 28. Jeremiah, chapter 28, and we're reading from the verse number 1. Jeremiah chapter 28, reading from the verse number 1. And it came to pass the same year in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah king of Judah, in the fourth year and in the fifth month, that Hananiah the son of Azur, the prophet which was of Gibeon, spake unto me in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priests and of all the people, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two full years will I bring again into this place all the vessels of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried them to Babylon. And I will bring again to this place Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, King of Judah, with all the captives of Judah that went into Babylon, saith the Lord, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. Then the prophet Jeremiah said unto the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and in the presence of all the people that stood in the house of the Lord, even the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. The Lord do so. The Lord perform thy words which I has prophesied to bring again the vessels of the Lord's house and all that is carried away captive from Babylon into this place. 
Nevertheless, hear thou now this word that I speak in thine ears and in the ears of all the people. The prophets that have been before me and before thee of old prophesied both against many countries and against great kingdoms of war and of evil and of pestilence. The prophet which prophesieth of peace, when the word of the Lord shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that the Lord hath truly sent him. Then Hananiah the prophet took the yoke from off the prophet Jeremiah's neck and brake it. And Hananiah spake in the presence of all the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Even so will I break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, from the neck of all nations within the space of two full years. And the prophet Jeremiah went his way. Then the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah the prophet, after that Hananiah had broken the yoke from off the neck of the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Go and tell Hananiah, Thus saith the Lord, Thou hast broken the yokes of wood, but thou shalt make for them yokes of iron. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have put a yoke of iron upon the neck of all these nations, that they may serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and they shall serve him. And I have given him the beasts of the field also. Then said the prophet Jeremiah unto Hananiah the prophet, Hear now, Hananiah, the Lord hath not sent thee, but thou makest this people to trust in a lie. Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will cast thee from off the face of the earth. This year thou shalt die, because thou hast taught rebellion yes. against the Lord. So Hananiah the prophet died the same year in the seventh month. Amen. We know that God will add his own blessing to the reading of his inspired and infallible word. We're now going to have talked for the, the boys and girls just for a few moments. And this morning we talked about something that is connected with the Reformation. Something that you see in church every time you come to church. And it's here in this place because of the Reformation. And of course that's the pulpit. And the reason why our pulpit is in the middle and the reason why it's situated where it is uh, is because the word of God must be central as we worship him. The word of God is in the middle. And the word of God uh, is what we come to church for, to hear God's word. Now I said to you this morning, tonight we're going to talk about another object you see in church every time you come to church. Any ideas what that other object might be? You're looking right at it. It's the communion table. So we're going to talk just for a little moment about the communion table. Now, we call our communion table a table. And that's really important. It's not an altar. Now, there's some churches, the Roman Catholic Church, and also you see it in Anglican churches, you hear them talking about an altar. But we will never talk about an altar. There's a very good reason for that. You see, an altar is a place of sacrifice. So if you go into the Old Testament, read about all of the altars, the altar was always made for a sacrifice. So the, the animal was taken and sacrificed upon the altar. But we don't have a place of sacrifice in the church. And the reason why we don't have a place of sacrifice is because Jesus has died for our sins. And that's why you read in the Old Testament about all of the offerings and all of the sacrifices. And we don't have sacrifices today because Jesus Christ has died. And when the Reformation came, the Reformer said, we don't need an altar because Jesus has died. No more sacrifice. We need a table. Now, an altar is something that's made of stone or marble. It's really heavy. You're not going to move it. It's really solid. That's the whole idea of an altar. If it's made for sacrifices, it needs to be a really strong object. You're not going to move it. But a table can be moved about because it's not made for sacrifice. And that's why we have a table. We have a good reason why we have a table. And, of course, this table is for remembering the Lord. So whenever we have communion, we remember the Lord Jesus who died for us. 
We don't offer a sacrifice. We remember he who died. But it's not just enough, you know, to know about this. You need to have him in your heart. So wonder, boys and girls, do you have the Lord Jesus in your heart? The Lord Jesus who has died for us on the cross. So please remember the two Reformation lessons today. The pulpit and the communion table. They're not here by accident. They are here because it is so important that we get things right when we come to God's house. We're now going to have the necessary announcements. And the first thing I want to do is to welcome the Reverend Ivan Foster. Um, The Reverend Foster was here at the very beginning of this work uh, 50 years ago. And this is our 50th anniversary. And it's so appropriate we have our brother back with us this year to minister God's word. And we want to thank him for all of his labours all those years ago. Because it was through those labours that this church came into being. And our brother has been a good friend of the congregation, a good friend of a good number of people in the congregation that have been here from the early years. And we thank you very much, brother, for coming along tonight. And we look forward to hearing you minister the word of God. It's good to have everyone joining with us in church, in the car park, and also at home. Thank you so much for joining with us today. Uh, Please remember our midweek prayer meeting and Bible study. That'll be Wednesday at 8 o'clock. And as I said this morning, our prayer meeting is going to be taken up uh, with praying for our land at this time of crisis. It's a health crisis. There's people suffering. There's people people dying. Um, It's an economic crisis. It's a time of great uncertainty. And there's many things we need to pray about. We need to pray for our health care workers. It's a difficult time for them. Uh, but we need to pray that our land will come to God at this time. And so please come along for the prayer meeting. We'll just have a, a short Bible reading, just a few thoughts, and we'll give the majority of the time over to prayer and come along for that on Friday night, please. And then if you could also... Uh, yeah, and they ask, so Wednesday night and then Friday night Youth Fellowship, and that will be at 8 o'clock. And next Lord's Day, the services at the regular times, half past 11 and 7. And do remember all the various prayer requests and bring these matters, please, before the Lord and pray the Lord would bless and undertake for his work and for those that are sick and for those that are laid aside at this time. It's good to have you, Mr. Foster. Uh, may the Lord bless you as you minister God's word now. I'm glad to see you, one and all, hiding behind the flowers there. I couldn't really see anybody, but it's good to see each one. And then there are those that I can't see, but I presume they can see me. Now, I have often said that I have a face made for the radio rather than the television. Uh, So those who are watching the video, perhaps, They'll just have to put up with it or else just listen and shut your eyes. But I do trust the Lord will bless you, whatever form of uh, listening and attention you give. It's good to be here, and I'd like to thank your minister, Mr. McIntyre, for the invitation. Uh, I was due to speak earlier in in the month, but uh, I'm sure you... I've heard the story of what happened on that occasion, so I'll not go over it except to just say that my wife has recovered well from the viral infection that put her in hospital, and which for a day or two, uh, or three, uh, was thought to be the uh, COVID virus that she had caught. But thankfully, she wasn't infected with it. Uh, It's a very serious matter for those of us who were on in years. And perhaps you will continue to remember Reverend Alan Cairns, who is very seriously ill from what I understand. Up there in the Colerain Hospital, the news of his illness struck me very hard, and my wife as well, because 
We have known Alan and Joan, his wife, who is also infected with the virus for many, many, many years and have the fondest memories of those early days of blessing in the free church when the work of God suddenly, under God's blessing, went forward at a great pace, a great pace. And Alan Cairns was one of those right at the centre of that. And it did hit us hard when we heard the news. So do pray for him. God is able. God is able. And there have been those who, though long afflicted with this virus, nevertheless have made a, a full recovery. Do pray for him. And perhaps if I might just make a little uh, advert at this point, we had one I'll call a son of Clotter Valley preach for us uh, in September, uh, the Reverend Brian McClung. And he took uh, at both services the subject of pestilences and dealt with what the Word of God has to say about that subject. Now, there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of confusion, and I'm talking just about God's people, never mind the general public. But there's a lot of confusion about just what is happening. Because we have to recognize that God is the one behind all this. Nothing happens outside of God's will and purpose. And this has to be seen in that context. And it was so good to hear Mr. McClung expound the word of God on the subject of pestilences, especially in the light of the last days. You know, brethren and sisters, there's matters to be prayed about today. We do need to pray for those who are sick, pray for those who are not sick that they might be kept from becoming sick. Pray for the staff in hospitals and all those who are laboring to help alleviate this plague. But might I ask you to think about the people in Egypt? When God began to send the ten plagues upon Egypt, Nobody prayed that God would stop the plagues. No Israelite prayed that. They recognized this is God working. This is God carrying out his purpose. And we have got to recognize there's something very like that taking place today. We're approaching the end of the age. We're approaching, I believe, the return of Christ. And if you read the book of Revelation, there you will find that his return has before it a great season of trouble and plagues and afflictions and judgment sent from God upon wicked nations. And I believe that what we are witnessing today is evidence of the beginnings of that. Do look up, you can find it on my website, you can find it on Mr. McClung's website, those two sermons. September, just go to the burning bush, scroll down to the September edition of the burning bush and you will find listed there those two sermons and I would urge you to listen into them and give heed to them. Well, that will do by way of introduction. I'm here to shorten the winter for you, if nothing else. We're turning to the book of Ezekiel, and we're turning to chapter 3 of the book of Ezekiel. And I'm just going to read one verse. 
one verse. And it's the verse 1 of Ezekiel chapter 3. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat that thou findest. Eat this roll. Now, we're not talking about a bread roll. We're talking about a parchment roll. It's the scriptures he's talking about. It's the word of God. Eat this roll and go speak unto the house of Israel. We'll have a wee word of prayer just before we go any further. Dear Lord, I pray now that you would give to me the help that you gave to Ezekiel. For Lord, we bless thee that the same power that was bestowed upon the prophets is available still to God's servants, I and God's people generally. O oh, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh upon us here tonight. Help me to speak, Lord, from this text. Cause this old mind to function and bring to my remembrance those things you would have me to say. For Jesus' sake, amen. Amen. I believe that we have here depicted in this verse that which will help us understand events that took place in Europe back in the days of the Great Reformation. The minister has already given to the young people a, a brief talk about that which was introduced and emphasized and restored at the time of the Reformation and which is still in use in a good Bible-believing Protestant church. From what he said, I understand he spoke about the pulpit in the morning and then tonight here about the communion table. And that's an emphasis on two very important doctrines that emerged as a result of events at the time of the Protestant Reformation. But if we would understand exactly what it was that brought about this emergence, this emphasis, this bringing back into the light the truth of God. This verse helps us. I think, too, that it's a verse that helps us to understand events in this valley 50 years ago. Not just in this valley, but events that were taking place in our province 50 years ago. The book of Ezekiel is, I believe, a much neglected book. There are certainly a lot of passages in it that require careful consideration. But it's given us of God, and if it is given us of God, it's for our good. It's for our good. And I would urge you to study the book and read the book. And don't be put off by difficult portions, but go back and read them again. For it's in reading them that you'll come to understand what God is saying. As you read the scriptures, gradually you will build up a knowledge of what the Bible is saying, and you will begin to, to put together, oh yes, I remember there's mention of this over in that other prophecy. And now I understand, and so we link together God's word. And that's essential. I would urge you then, not just to read the book of Ezekiel, but to read the whole of the Bible and that systematically, because we need to do that. It's the only book that has the answer to the 
puzzling circumstances that we find ourselves and the nations of the world find themselves in today. This is a book for today, the book of Ezekiel. And the reason I say that is, as it is in nature, so it is in the realm of events that cross our paths. We're into autumn. But 12 months ago, we had an autumn. And 12 months before that, we had an autumn. And 12 months before that, we had an autumn. And some of us don't care to remember how many autumns we have seen. But there is that reoccurrence, that cycle of life, and it's demonstrated in nature. Now, each autumn is basically the same, but not in the smallest details the same. There are always distinctions. Some autumns are milder than others. Some are wetter, some are colder, some are more windy, etc., etc., etc. And so it is with the events that take place in this world. There are cycles. There are cycles. And that which God's people today are encountering have been encountered in the past by former generations of God's people. Perhaps not exactly the same. But the circumstances are broadly similar. That's why Romans chapter 15 is absolutely true. And Romans 15 and the verse 4 says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scripture might have hope. You see, the Bible's relevant. The world says the Bible's an old book. The last pages of it were written long, long, long ago, nearly 2,000 years ago. But that doesn't matter. It's relevant. Because it records this, the, the circumstances through which God's people have passed in former times, and we're going through the same. And as we look at the Bible, finding portions that are relevant, related to us, we can find comfort and hope and discover a means that helps us to patiently bear with those things. So that when we come to this text, I tell you, it's very relevant. Now, it's 2,600 years ago since Ezekiel wrote these words. But, oh, they're up to date. They're up to date. First thing I want to, to do is that to show you that they're up to date. Because here is teaching for our day. Here is teaching for our day. And of course, I've got to prove that statement. And I would have you look with me at, at, at just what is written here in the book of Ezekiel. And I think we will see that these words are relevant. I often remember in years gone by that when perhaps an old aunt or an old granny would visit and they'd meet someone of a similar age uh, in the ho household and they'd begin to talk about their aches and their pains. And then they'd go on to talk about the tablets and the medicine that they take for their aches and their pains. And of course they never gave the uh, chemical name for the medicine they were taking. It was green or it was blue or it was a pink tablet that was round or a square tablet that was blue and 
that's what they would discuss. And does it help you? And before you know it, they'd nearly be ready to swap tablets to see if it would help them. Well, here's medicine. For ills that afflicted God's people 2,600 years ago. And I'm telling you, it's medicine that you and I can take today. Because the ailments they suffered from, we see all around us today. All around us. Let me prove that to you by first and foremost saying that for God's people, for Israel, it was a day of defeat and retreat. Wasn't a good day. Ezekiel was called upon to minister God's word in a rather dark and dismal time. It wasn't a day of revival. Oh, God was working. God's spirit was working. You read many, many references to the experience of, of Ezekiel of the grace and power of the Holy Ghost. God's spirit never leaves his people. No matter how dark is the time, he never leaves his people. But it wasn't a day in which there was a moving of the spirit of God upon the face of the people, upon the populace generally. And can we not say that is the case today? Look at how the book of Ezekiel begins. Just Turn over one page in my Bible, and I'm sure it's about the same in yours, to Ezekiel chapter 1 and the verse 1. Now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Kabar. Notice the little phrase. I was among the captives. It was a day of of defeat. It was a day in which the people of God were in captivity. They had been overcome by their enemies. I had Mr. McIntyre read for us Uh, what is contained in the book of Jeremiah, the chapter 28, and I'll be coming to that later. But it was a day of defeat. It was a day of captivity, and yet there were many who denied it was such, who were blind to the true state of affairs among the people of God. But what was taking place here in this day that chapter 3 verse 1 is situated was a fulfilling of the threatenings of God going back a long time. If you turn to the book of Isaiah, you will find Isaiah the prophet quite quite a number of years before, over a hundred years before, warning the nation that the path it was following would lead it to captivity, would lead it to slavery under their enemies. Well, they didn't heed Isaiah. Following Isaiah... There was the prophet Jeremiah, and he, in like manner, warned the people that there was judgment coming. But they took no heed to him either. People refused to heed the truth of God. They didn't want to listen. Just quickly, because I do like to prove what I'm saying. If you look at verse 7 of this chapter, God reports the attitudes of the people. 
Likely attitudes they didn't recognize among themselves, but which God saw. Verse 7, But the house of Israel will not hearken unto thee, for they will not hearken unto me. And that's the spirit that had been prevailing for generations among the nation of Israel. And now they're reaping the consequences. They're captives. And men and women, I, I, I want you to see that a similar situation is coming upon the land. You see, I look back 50 years. And 50 years ago, we were warning the people in the ecumenical churches, you're heading for trouble. And you'll bring trouble on the land. Judgment will follow your apostasy. That was in essence what the Free Presbyterian Church preached in those times of blessing. That's why God blessed the Free Church. Because it spoke boldly God's truth to a land that was departing from the ways of Nicholson. It was departing from the ways of former times of revival. It was turning its back upon what God had done in former ages. And the Free Presbyterian Church was raised by God to sound out that warning. And when it did sound out that warning under the leadership of Dr. Paisley, God blessed it. God blessed it. Now, it would be nice for me to say to you, God bless the free church because those days the preachers were wonderful. But that's not the truth. That's not the truth. The preachers were blessed of God because they simply told what God's word said. That's what, that's what brought about the blessing of the Lord. I remember having a long-running, well, somewhat long-running controversy with the bishop here in Clogher. We protested, along with some of you who are here still, we protested at his installation in the cathedral down the road. And as a result, we got put out of Andrew's Woods. Orange Hall, because it annoyed some of those who were in charge of the hall because we were protesting against their bishop. And we, were, we weren't standing meekly like a bunch of sheep on the side of the road. We were howling out our message and our protests and telling the people, ready to listen, just what that bishop was. He was an old apostate. An old apostate. Well, we had some letters in the paper. I remember on one occasion, he, made, he never made reference to me directly. Never mentioned my name. But he used to apply many uh, a large adjective to those who opposed what it was he was seeking to do. And on one occasion, he called me an obscurantist. And I had a baldy notion what that was. <laughs> so I had to resort to the dictionary. And learning what it was, I was more than happy to answer him. Now, he was a Cambridge graduate, if I'm not mistaken. He had been a professor there. God help the students in Cambridge. But he had been a professor there, and he came here to educate the peasants and discovered that, that he couldn't. So he went back, I think, to Cambridge after a year or two. But I used to write letters and challenge him again and again and again. Meet me on a platform. Meet me on a platform. 
Now, with regards, he was very much superior in his education to what education I could lay claim to. But he wouldn't meet me on a platform with a Bible in my hand. For this obscurantist would beat the head off him when it came to discussing the truth of God. That old reprobate who boasted in his knowledge, boasted in his professorship, boasted in his intellectualism, but he was frightened of the Bible even when it was held in the hand of an uneducated fool as far as he was concerned. No, it wasn't any greatness on the part of preachers that were in the free church at that time. It was the message God blessed. The message God blessed. And that message built this place, laid the foundations of it. And this place will only prosper as long as it adheres to what it is God would have us tell the people around us, even as he had Ezekiel tell the people. We're living in a day, as was Ezekiel, when there is a spirit and an air of captivity, of defeat in our land. Again, it was a day in which God's threats of judgment had been fulfilled. I mentioned how the free church back then warned the people that their involvement in ecumenism and seeking union with Rome would bring God's judgment upon the land. And it has. We passed through a terrible time of terrorism and affliction upon this land an affliction that affected chiefly the Protestant people. It was they who were, to a very large degree, the chief victims of the terrorism. And I believe that was, that was part of the harvest of apostasy. But it hasn't ended. Protestantism today has never been weaker here in Northern Ireland than it is at present. Our enemies, the ecumenists, the papists, have very much the ball at their toe and could do what they like. And anyone who studies politics and studies politics in the light of God's word and not wearing rose-tinted glasses of any particular shade of rose can observe how that whatever republicanism wants republicanism gets and whatever unionism believes is good for the country it can never really accomplish that desire this is a day when judgment is being fulfilled as I said, Ezekiel was preaching to captives. He was preaching to people upon whom the judgment of God had fallen, who had suffered the loss of their liberty, the loss of their heritage, the loss of their nation, and were sitting now in an alien land because the judgments that the prophets had warned about had come about. I mentioned Isaiah, I mentioned Jeremiah. They had warned that this would come about. And come about, it has. You know, it's sad to note though every evidence of the disapproval of God and the withdrawing of his blessing from the nation of Israel was evident 
There was every evidence of it. But still there were those who went about preaching and denying that they were suffering any form of defeat or that God was in any way vexed and grieved and angry with them. Do you remember what you read in Jeremiah 28 or heard read to you in Jeremiah chapter 28? And let me tell you a little thing. Sometimes these things are not quite so obvious. But the date of this chapter, Jeremiah chapter 28, is approximately the same date. And I mean within a month or so of the chapter 3 of Ezekiel. So when God's sending Ezekiel in the land of Babylon to speak to those who have been taken away out of Israel and speak to them about God's word, they who are captives in Jerusalem, which had already suffered an invasion by the Babylonians, but not total destruction. The destruction of Babylon in the days of Jeremiah, when the temple was burned and, and all that was in it was taken away. That happened in, in a, a series of attacks. But the first of those attacks had taken place. There were in Babylon those who had been taken out of Jerusalem and out of Israel at the very time that you read here of events in Jeremiah 28. And in Jeremiah 28, you have an old apostate, Hananiah, preaching. Listen to his message. He says, verse 2, Thus saith the Lord. That's the first thing. He was claiming to be God's spokesman. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Don't be worrying about Babylon. Oh yes, they have invaded the city and broken into it and taken away captives from it and materials and wealth. Yes, but don't worry. God says... He's going to break Babylon. Now Jeremiah and Isaiah in earlier times had said that's not going to be the case. Babylon's going to come destroy the place completely. Destroy the place completely. But here, even though the beginning of the destruction was taking place, here's an old false prophet and he's issuing promises to the people that are the most wickedly false. Within two full years will I bring again into this place all the vessels of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from the place and carried them to Babylon. See that he has already invaded this man, Nebuchadnezzar. He had taken away plunder. But this old false prophet says, ah, God says he's going to reverse that all. He's going to make Nebuchadnezzar bring it back. Well, you know, men and women, <clears throat> if you read chapter 39 of Jeremiah, you'll see the final assault by the Babylonians, and that was only six years later. And he utterly destroys the city. Destroys the city. And in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, you get descriptions of the consequences of what happened to Jerusalem just six years after this man issued these false promises, this false hope. And I tell you that there are many today who would hold out false hope to us point away forward 
And the way forward does not entail any repentance, any acknowledgement that we have abandoned God's truth. No. The way forward as far as the apostate is concerned is to, with greater effort, go down the road that we have been going down and which has brought us into the state of captivity and misery. The people had been banished to a strange land. If you turn with me to Psalm 137, this is the circumstances that surrounded the people who had been carried away from Jerusalem by Babylon, people who doubtless had listened to that false prophet and had not listened to the words of Isaiah and the words of Jeremiah calling upon the people to seek the old paths wherein was the good way. No, they said, we're, we're not doing that. We're going to press on with our idolatry. We're going to press on with our embracing of the false gods. Well, here's the consequences set forth in uh, the Psalm 137, by the waters of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. Let me tell you something, men and women. If things go on in our country the way they're going, we'll only have memories. That's all we'll have left. We'll have nothing of the Ulster of years ago. We just have memories. And it will only be some who will have memories. There's a generation growing up in Ulster and they have no knowledge whatsoever of the benefits that we enjoyed a generation ago. We hanged our harps Upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. Can't you hear the mocking Babylonians? Come on, you Jews. Let's hear some of your songs about Zion and about the land that God gave you. Come and sing some of those songs. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? There is a sorrow in this psalm, men and women, I want you to ponder, because it's a sorrow that's coming upon the Protestant people. Because there has been amongst the Protestant people a heeding of the false prophets and a rejecting of the truth of God. And that's why I say what we read in this verse, verse 1, Ezekiel 3, is relevant to today. Relevant to today. The second thing I want to show you from the verse, we can take hope. For the Lord has a word for such as are captives and have felt his judgment and his wrath. We can take hope, not the false hope propagated by the false prophets, the deceptions and the lies that are abroad today. No. We can take hope from what we read in the Bible. Look at what it says. Moreover, we're back at our text, verse 1, Ezekiel 3. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat that thou findest, eat the roll, and go and speak 
unto the house of Israel. There's always hope as long as God is speaking to us. When God goes silent, all hope is gone. All hope is gone. Oh, I hope you read your Bible and heed what it is God is saying. Now, what word Ezekiel had for the people of his day was an unchanged word. It was the old message. And I come back again to what happened 50 years ago. The success that was enjoyed 50 years ago was born of the fact that we were preaching the old word. There was a resurrection of the old word. I remember my first meetings in the Clogher Valley. They were in Baskin Boyd's house. A sincere and godly man with a burden for those around him. And he ran a little meeting in his house and he invited folk, fellow Methodists at that time, or I should say they were formally fellow Methodists. He had left the Methodists and was attending the free church in this below. But he had a burden for them. Ingrid could tell me, I'm sure, but I have a notion that the first meeting I had there sort of cleaned out that little gathering and uh, it somewhat diminished afterwards. Because I, I just went in and said, here's what God's word says. You've got to get out of the old Methodist church. You've got to get out of the old church of Ireland. It has apostatized from God. It has embraced idolatry and wickedness and darkness. And you will come under the judgment of God if you don't get out of it. Well, that wasn't what a lot of even Christians Wanted to hear. They wanted to hold on to their church. Mommy had been there and Daddy had been there and Granda had been there and Granny had been there. I want to hold on to my old church. Yes, but if your old church has laid hold upon the lie, then if you hold on to the church, you're holding on to the lie. That's, that's, what, that's what gave the free church in those days its energy, its power, its influence. It was preaching the old message. It's thus saith the Lord. That's what, that's what this man had to say. And you can see that phrase in the chapter 2 and also in this chapter we're looking at. He opened his mouth and he said, thus saith the Lord. You see, he had eaten the roll. He had eaten the book of God. And when he opened his mouth, out came the words of the book. I remember getting into a bus in London Airport, one of those buses that took you around from terminal to terminal. It was early in the morning. And the doors of the bus opened. I don't think there was anybody else in apart from the driver. And as I stepped in, it was like stepping into an Indian curry house. The smell of garlic would have knocked you down. And it all came from one source, the driver, who was an Asian man, and he probably had eaten a bucket of the stuff the night before. And when he opened his mouth, <laughs> the evidence of it was there. Well, when you eat the Bible, the savour of it, the perfume of it, the influence of it will come out. And the free church in those days was a church that ate the Bible. He ate the Bible. Nothing new and was said 50 years ago. And I'm thankful tonight I haven't one new word to say to you. Nothing new, same old message. What the Bible teaches us. 
It's a difficult message to preach. People want to hear something that's new, want to hear something that's bright. Did you notice how uh, they have come to nickname those medical scientists who come on to give their opinion as to the spread of the virus and what is the answer to it. They've given them nicknames, not very complimentary nicknames. Dr. Gloom, I think, is one of them. Why don't you tell us a lie and say it's like that idiot of a president in the United States. You should pray for the American people. What a judgment has come upon them when an an idiot like that has come to power. I'm not looking forward to any trips to America so I can say what I like about him. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't get in if I did try to get in, having said that. But he's a fool of a man, a fool of a man. And every time he opens his mouth, you, you marvel that something even of greater folly comes forth. But the medical scientists, are, they're, they're derided for saying, but this, this virus will kill. This virus, if it's not tackled properly, it will spread. It'll increase and there'll be more people affected. Oh, don't tell us that. Tell us we can go to the pub. Tell us we can go to the beach. Tell us we can mingle together and there'll be no result. That, that's what old Trump says. And, of course, he blames himself to the fact that there are hundreds of thousands of people in America infected and hundreds of thousands dying and will die as a result. No, this is not an easy message to preach. Jeremiah, Isaiah, and now Ezekiel, in preaching the plain word of God in the midst of apostasy, they were going to find themselves anything but popular. Anything but popular. And the free church in those days weren't popular. Every effort was made by the local churches to stop the building of, the, of this building here. Or what existed before this building was erected. Every effort was made. We only had come into the site and started with spades and wheelbarrows to sort of level it out and make it ready for a a wooden hall when the council officials came and they were summoned by the Church of Ireland, the Methodists, and whatever else there was in Five Mile Town and in the area. The ministers of those denominations, they put them up to it. I remember it well. Of course, we, we loved those confrontations. We enjoyed it. There's some of you can remember. It was the best day outing that we had for a good while. They came along, you can't do this, you can't do that, you've got to get out, get away. I thought I was. <laughs> and off they went with their tail between their legs. You know, they actually said, you can't open out onto that side road and then open onto the main road. You can't do that. That's, that, that's just impossible. It breaks all the laws of traffic regulation. What you can do is there's a road up the hill there, and you know it is, it's that little road opposite, it goes round the loop and it comes out up the road. You could build in on that road, get a plot in there. Well, how does that differ from what we're doing here? We get a plot in there, we open onto that little road, and then out onto the main road, just the same as here. What really defeated them was are pressing upon the council the fact that the chief of the planning in the council had a bungalow, the far side of what is Bali Gali. Far side of Bali Gali. And his bungalow, nice twisting driveway came down and opened out onto the very road we're on here. Same road. So we said, well, sure, if he can do it, why can't we do it? Especially when we're not opening directly onto the road, we're opening onto a side road and then exiting via the side road onto the main road. That put an end to the council's objections. 
But they were there ready to shut us down. Because what we were saying was not popular. and was most unacceptable. It was like it was in Noah's day. Like all the days of apostasy when God's men stood up. Old Elijah, Elisha, all the prophets, they ran into the same opposition. And yet, in the words of Ezekiel, men and women, there was comfort and hope. I really don't have time tonight. But if you were to take your Bible dictionary and look up the word remnant and look and find where it appears in the book of Ezekiel, you'll find that God, through Ezekiel, time and time and time again, promises a bright future for a remnant. He's telling the people, I haven't forgotten my people. I've chastened them. I've brought judgment on them. I've humbled them because of their sin, but I haven't abandoned them. And he sets out what it is he's going to do for the, the, the remnant within the captivity. And I'll leave it there. Just please do that little study, for I want to quickly come to the last point I want to make. Please notice that the experience of the man of God... Ezekiel is the experience that those who would stand up for the Lord and witness for the Lord in a day such as this must have. And that is, eat the roll. Eat the roll. And when you've eaten the roll, go speak unto the house of Israel. You can gain a knowledge of food by looking at it. By looking at it. We make use of one of those agencies that send you out meals. Wonderfully prepared. The one that we use, I must say, I, I, I could not desire better food. But they send you out a catalog and boy, your mouth would water just looking at the pictures of the food. But looking at the pictures would not make you fat. Nor will it take away the hunger. You can stand up beside where food is being cooked and you can sniff in the aroma. That'll tell you a lot about the food. But it won't put flesh on your bones. It's only when you eat that you gain the benefits and the nourishment from food. And so it is with the Word of God. And if I were to try and define the people of 50 years ago, they were people who ate the Bible. They feasted on the Word of God. You ever see a little one and it's being fed by mother and maybe it's come to a little tough bit and it's chewing and 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 mother's fed up with the chewing and urging it to swallow it but the little one's struggling a little bit and then finally it gulps it down As a minister, I used to be able to see people, families, chewing, considering what it was they were hearing regarding separation, obedience to God, holiness, walking in the light of God's truth. I saw them chewing over it. And I saw the struggle sometimes to get it swallowed. Then I saw the change. 
when they swallowed, when they embraced God's truth, I saw the change. I saw the peace, the joy that settled in upon them and the courage with which they stood up for God and his truth. That's what put the difference. That's what built this place. A people who ate the word of God and believed it. And said we've got to live by this. We've got to act upon it. That's what built this place. And that's what's needed today. Man. There are too many Christians who merely take a no little lick at the Bible. That's about the height of it. A little lick at the Bible. They've bought some little book that gives them a day by day little thought and there's a verse and it amounts to a lick of the Bible. It's not a feasting, not an eating, not a swallowing of the truth of God. That's what we need today. There's a shallowness about the Christianity of today. We can set aside the rules of God, just the way people set aside the rules concerning social distancing and so forth. Today, we, we, we know all about it. When we're suffering the consequences of those rules being set aside, but it gives us an illustration. There is a like consequence for setting aside God's truth. God's truth on how we live, how we speak, how we deal with others, how we dress. Christians have set these things aside to some degree or other. It doesn't matter, they say. It's all right. No. Ezekiel didn't eat part of what was given to him and spit out the bits that he didn't like. He ate it all. And back in those days, I tell you, the folk were humble people who embraced the Bible in its entirety. In its entirety. And we need, in the pulpit and in the pew, those who have eaten the word of God. It was only after he ate the roll that God said, now go and speak. I remember just after I was saved, it really was only a very short time, maybe a couple of months, Dr. Paisley was speaking in Balamina. Uh, in the old tabernacle, there was no Balamina Free Presbyterian Church. He was speaking in his father's independent Baptist tabernacle. He says, I want you come down on me. And you can give your testimony. So you did what you're told. And down I went, and I gave my testimony. And there's a wee man, I remember him yet. Afterwards he said, son, you read your Bible every day. Because if you do, it will speak out through you. That was, that was good advice. And that's still true. You read your Bible, study your Bible. Embrace your Bible. Build and build and build and build your knowledge of the Bible and it will speak out through you. How does a baby learn to speak English? It learns from listening to others. And it learns not only to speak English, but it learns to speak English with a Tyrone accent because it's learned by listening to those around we will become like the prophets, like the Lord Jesus, if we listen to his precious word. I tell you, the free church needs again a fresh endowment of that which Ezekiel experienced here. Ezekiel was prepared of God for the task. You know what it says there? As you read on into the next verse. So I opened my mouth. And he caused me to eat. Do you know what it is to learn the Bible? It's to be spoon fed 
by God. That's what it means. We should come to the Bible with our mouth open. And God will spoon in his truth. That's what it says here. I opened my mouth and he caused me to eat. You can never learn the Bible. You can never, never learn the Bible without God's help. Without the moving of God. You never learn the Bible. And in those days, God was moving. There was no learning in the free church. I have to come back to say that. Nobody knows that better than me. I was saved through the witnessing of a girl quoting a verse of scripture and I had no idea where it was in the Bible. And even if she had told me where it was in the Bible, I couldn't have found it. Oh, I was ignorant. And I have lived with the consciousness all my days that I'm no scholar. I, I have nothing to boast about. But I'm thankful God has given me some understanding of his word. He's given me some understanding of his word. Like, like, like David when he went out to face Goliath with all his armor, his shield and his sword and all the rest of it on his size. And David came out with his wee sling didn't amount to much. In fact, it caused Goliath to mock him. And there was plenty of mocking directed at the Free Church and its ministers. But we had a sling. And God had taught us in those days how to use it to some degree. Micah the prophet said this, I am full of the power of the Spirit of the Lord and of judgment and of might to declare unto Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. If ever a man needs to be full of the Holy Ghost, it's the man who's going to tell God's people their sin. That man needs power. I was ordained in Lisbon in 1968 and Dr. Paisley preached I'll never forget it he preached from Jeremiah chapter 1 Jeremiah by the providence of God has featured a lot in my life unplanned by me but I have found myself consulting Jeremiah time and time and time again on that night of my ordination Dr. Paisley preached on it, and I remember him telling me, emphasizing what God said to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 18 says, For behold, I have made thee this day a defensed city, and an iron pillar, and brazen walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against the princes thereof, against the priests thereof, and against the people of the land. And they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee, for I am with thee, saith the Lord, to deliver thee. I remember to this day him saying those words to me and saying, Lad, that's what God would have you to become. You'll be against everybody and everybody will be against you. And I've done very, well, tried my very best to live up to that. And I've been against an awful lot throughout my life. Not on personal basis, but only activated by whether or not a person is obeying God. If they're disobeying God, well, I'm again them. I'm against them. I never had a cup of coffee with an old Presbyterian minister or a Church of Ireland minister. Never had any communication with them because they were wrong. Even if they were evangelicals, they were wrong. They were propping up an apostate system. And I wouldn't endorse that 
for one moment. Yes, blame Ian Paisley. He told me I was to be against it all, and I've done my best to do that. You know, you read in one other place, and here I'm going to close now, I'm going to close. You read in one other place about a servant of God eating the scriptures, the book of Revelation, and it's in the chapter 10, the book of the Revelation, the book that has to do with today, it has to do with today, for we, as it were, have caught up with what God has revealed in the book of Revelation. 2,000 years ago, God was basically saying, here's what's going to happen. Well, we've caught up with that. And what God said was going to happen is beginning to happen. And then chapter 10 of Revelation, and the verses 8 and 9, listen to these words. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. You've got to ask for it. You want to know the Bible, you've got to say, Lord, teach me thy word. Teach me thy word. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey what does that mean well if you eat the bible you'll discover what it means there's not a part of the bible that the christian doesn't enjoy eating and reading my meditations of him have been sweet we read. And no matter where you go in the Bible and you read it, it's sweet. It's sweet. But when the preacher takes up the word of God and begins to proclaim it, it becomes a better thing. He finds that there are consequences to his bearing testimony to the truth of God and he'll have to endure bitterness and opposition just like the Lord Jesus just like the Lord Jesus why did one who did nothing but good among men suffer so and he illustrates what it means you eat God's word and begin to live it and apply it there'll be plenty of bitterness heaped upon you but God's smile will be there amidst the bitter opposition of men men and women this is a word for today the great reformers that wrought so much good in Europe, good that lasts still to a sizable measure to this very day, were men who ate the word of God. It was part of them. It was part of them. We need people today who have eaten the word of God. That's their diet. That's their diet. And they don't... They don't eat anything else. They live entirely. The Lord Jesus said, I am the bread of life. We live of him. We'll have life indeed. Well, may the Lord bless his word to your heart. I've probably kept you back from getting to bed, but I trust it has been a benefit and a help. And you'll not see me again anyway for another 50 years, so... You'll get over it in time. Let's bow together, please, then, in prayer. O oh God, our Heavenly Father, 
I pray that you would give us an appetite for the word of God. Take away the appetites of the flesh, Lord, and grant that we might long after the pure food of heaven and feasting upon it become a benefit and a blessing to our own families and to those immediately connected with us and to all within our society. Lord, the people who ate the scriptures back 50 years ago, they've blessed the people and the area of the Tlaher Valley since. Lord, may we learn again to return to those days. Take us home now in safety, I pray, and apply your word with power to every heart. For Jesus' sake, amen. Amen. I'll not be going to the door, folks. Just in case 